everyone. Uh, I just wanted to go ahead and welcome you to uh, the election security press briefing uh, held by the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleagues, Joe Hall and Maurice Turner. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Uh, we have somewhere between 40 or 50 people on this call. And um, we've bulk muted you all, um, so there won't be a lot of talking other than us. But please feel free, as Elizabeth said, to submit comments either via the Web WebEx chat feature or by emailing us at press at cdt.org. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking a lot, but you'll hear my colleague, Maurice Turner. Hello. Inter uh, interject from time to time as well. So ho hopefully you can tell the difference between our voices, but if not, um, tough. So we're here to talk about election security in the midterms. There's a very quick outline. We're, uh, we can't assume all of you are as election geeks as we are, and because of that, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some of the technical aspects of elections, how we sort of arrived at where we're at, um, some of the best practices in elections uh, and cybersecurity controls that, that people have been talking about, and then finally, we'll spend some time talking about CDT specific efforts and materials for election officials. And many of the materials we're creating for election officials are, will be just as useful for you in your reporting. Uh, it, 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 the whole point is to make materials that are comprehensible by lay people in terms of cybersecurity, but with a particular focus on people who run elections. Um, I'll talk for maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll spend the rest of the time uh, getting questions from you and answering those questions. So uh, just to give you a quick idea of who we are, um, CDT, if you haven't heard of us, we've been around for about 25 years. We're sort of a joint advocacy organization and also research shop. So we, in addition to being experts in, in, in doing a variety of, of research reports and, and things in the research side, we also advocate for specific kinds of change in the world and we, we do do legislative advocacy as well. So you'll hear a little, you'll, you'll hear that um, in and out of this, this presentation. Uh, uh, in terms of our background, I'm the chief technologist. My name is Joe, Joseph Lorenzo Hall. Uh, I typically write it as Joseph Lorenzo Hall because there's two other Joe Halls that are more famous than I am. Um, I uh, have a background uh, uh, from UC Berkeley, I have a PhD in information systems and a master's in astrophysics. All uh, my PhD work entirely focused around um, hacking voting machines. And that was in 2008 when it wasn't nearly as as a, uh, as a uh, topic at the front of our minds as, as it is now. My colleague Maurice Turner, our senior technologist here, he has a master's of public administration from University of Southern California. Has spent quite a bit of time thinking about cybersecurity and has been working for over 30 years in areas related to both civic life and technology. So, in terms of election technology, um, it's probably modest to say that attention to elections and election technology is episodic at best. Um, some of you may remember the 2000 election and how that sort of lasted for a couple of years until we passed the Help America Vote Act. That was the culmination of a lot of attention on machine failures and usability failures even in the 2000 election. Um, there was a period after which, after the 2006 election, where there was a little bit more attention, that resulted in a number of things, notably in, in my particular life, um, two state-level security evaluations of voting machines. So the California Secretary of State sponsored the TTBR, or the Top to Bottom Review, and the Ohio Secretary of State sponsored the Everest Review, which that Everest is an actual acronym, don't, don't ask me what it means, Google it, I don't remember. Um, but both of those studies were essentially secretaries of states giving over to academic teams all the voting technologies they used in their state for security evaluation. Um, so that was, you know, a, a pretty important feature in the, the technical evaluation of these systems. And, and the reason I bring that up is that, you know, uh, if you've heard about DEF CON and the voting machine hacking village that's happened in the past two years, in many cases, those machines that we were able to obtain for the voting machine village uh, are older than even those studies or are running software from those from before those uh, security evaluations were, were completed. So the flaws that we find in 
systems 10 years ago, unfortunately, and voting are still there. Um, uh, now, that's not how it is everywhere. The elections are extremely variable throughout the United States. There are 10,000 election jurisdictions in, in the United States, and you might say, hey, wait a sec, there's 3,000 some counties. How can there be 10,000 election jurisdictions? Well, some states, Wisconsin, um, a couple of other in the Midwestern states and a New, a New England state or two, actually delegate the authority to run elections down to towns or cities. That dramatically increases the number of election jurisdictions. Um, and of course, 2016, we know that that was, uh, we, we, we faced quite a bit of adversarial attention to our voting systems in the 2016 election. And that sort of sustained through to now, there's been um, some uh, notification that there are still Russian uh, uh, agents sort of attempting to sway elections in the United States in various ways. The, the Senator McCaskill, for example, came out saying that she had been part of an attack. There were two, um, I believe both Democratic congressmen members or, or Democratic uh, candidates running for Congress in California that were both subject to ver uh, in one case a keylogger and another case a, what's called a, a denial of service attack, which is a flood of traffic so big that their uh, uh, election website cannot handle that much traffic. Um, but we've also sort of learned a lot over the years. Up to about 2016, many of us that worked in this area focused specifically on hacks that would change the vote count. Uh, so things that might actually affect the outcome in terms of numbers, in terms of changing the number of ballots allocate, allocated to a specific issue or individual uh, running for uh, 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 office. Uh, but now we know that there are, there are other kinds of threats. So, for example, in addition to changes of vote counts, there, are, there is disruption and there are things like denial of service. Um, disruption, for example, and, and disinformation, I should say. I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize disinformation, but we tend to speak a lot here in our project uh, at CAT about specific threats to the numbers and, and the processes of elections, not so much um, the, the, there's a different part of the house here at CDT, the free expression uh, project that works more on the disinformation, misinformation, malinformation side of the house. Happy to take questions about those. We may not be the best to answer them, but we'll, we can direct those to people who, who could. Um, so in addition to those different types of, of, of threats, we also have different kinds of threat actors. Uh, we know there are nation states that are uh, targeting our elections. The Russians have been very active. Russian military intelligence, the GRU, has been very active. Um, we've started to see China and Iran uh, incorporate elements of the Russian playbook, so to speak, in attacking other elections around the world. The Chinese, for example, broke in to the Cambodian uh, election uh, headquarters uh, a couple of weeks before their recent presidential election. Um, so we know that, that this isn't something that is just confined to one nation, it's actually spreading. The election technology out there is, is highly variable across those 10,000 jurisdictions. There are still jurisdictions that do hand-counted paper ballots. Um, that, those are typically very small jurisdictions. There's not a whole lot of them. Um, but that just goes to show that we do, we do have some people in, in this country who do vote without using computers at all. Um, so it's very variable. Um, it's very old. A, a great statistic that I pulled from um, Professor Alex Halderman from University of Michigan, his 2017 testimony um, last year in front of the Senate rules, uh, I believe the Senate rules, uh, that may be wrong, but anyway, um, I can get that for you. Um, he said, and, and I looked at this, and it, 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 uh, basically, um, in 2016, 43 states used voting systems that were 10 years old or older. Um, that's improved a little bit in the two years since 2016. But not a lot. It, you know, two years isn't a, a whole lot of time to do a procurement of a new voting system. Um, it, it's actually the kind of it, it may take longer to get budget authority and do a whole bunch of things. So we haven't seen a whole lot of changes. We have seen some hints that a bunch of places are on the move. For example, Georgia, which uses a paperless system throughout its entire state, has recently put a request for proposals out a procurement action for a new voting system, none of the options of which include any paperless system. Um, and, you know, we're saying election tech is, is highly variable, mostly old. It's also very under-resourced. And what we mean by that is that, you know, elections have always struggled to attract funding to run the elections themselves. And 
that's you know well, the, a typical thing you'll hear you'll hear people say at the local level is if there's uh, money and you're going to fill fill a pothole or buy a new voting machine, you better believe you're going to fill that pothole because that's something they're going to hear a lot more about than they would if, than the voting machine, which can be in some places something that people only interact with once every couple of years. Um, and voting machines themselves, as I've been hinting at, are, are, are important, right? They mediate the actual vote counting itself, but they're a pretty narrow part of elections. And so we've seen a lot of other things subject to attack that can be just as serious, in our opinion, as the vote counts themselves. Voter registration systems, a number of which were targeted in 2016. The state of Illinois has had their voter registration system compromised and a certain amount of, of records exfiltrated, which means stolen from that voter registration database. We have new things that people may be unfamiliar with. So for example, electronic poll books. This is when you walk into a polling place to vote, typically you would state your name and they would cross you off a spiral bound book and, and let you vote. Uh, nowadays, those things are being moved into laptop and uh, tablet computer formats. So instead of having a spiral bound notebook, you may have a computer that checks people in. Um, but those are also things we worry about. Electronic poll books are not federally or state certified in many cases. So those are gonna be considered not part of the voting system itself. So maybe treated quite differently. There's also election night reporting systems. So these are the systems that, as reporters, you probably know very well where um, this is where you'd go to look at the official results from a county or from a state, and you'd hit refresh quite a bit over the night to make sure you had the most recent results. Well, we've seen those things get attacked most recently in Knox County, Tennessee, where we saw during their primary a, um, a denial of service attack, a flood of traffic hit their election night reporting system and take it down. And that's a pretty uh, ham-fisted attack. It's sort of the easier attacks that we know of. But in this case, it was actually used as a diversion. Um, so this, this flood of information that took down their election night reporting site was used as a diversion to mask another kind of attack into another part of their system. Um, and, you know, something that people don't realize, but, you know, election officials have office networks, just like your office has a network that you use for email and all that kind of stuff, you know, what we call a business network, your network that you use to get things done in your office, those increasingly are things we worry about because it's not so hard to get malware into them and malware can do a whole bunch of things. For example, if you're familiar with what happened to Atlanta recently, um, they suffered a massive ransomware attack that took out a number of their municipal departments um, after a piece of malware got through their their system. And right, ransomware, if you're not familiar with it, is malicious software that locks up all your files on your device and demands payment to let them go. Um, and as we say, in any kind of ransom situation, um, you never know if you pay them, if you gain, you're gonna get the thing back that they're holding hostage. Um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of voting machines themselves. It's actually not very useful to spend time going through them here. Um, there's plenty of materials we can point you to if you need to look, get smart on the different kinds of voting machines out there. Um, but really briefly, a lot of the machines used up until around 2000, 2002 were hand count, either hand count or, or lever machines, right? Uh, sorry, lever machines or punch card machines. Those were machines that could last 20 or 30, 40 years. Um, they had mechanical parts you could replace pretty easily, buy a new paper, which is sort of, you know, the ammunition, so to speak, of the voting machine. Um, in around 2000 and before that even, there was a move towards eliminating paper entirely, especially around the money around the Help America Vote Act, which was used to purchase a lot of paperless systems. Paperless systems or fully electronic systems are ones that we typically, for whatever reason, call DREs. It's an acronym for direct recording electronic. It just means that there's, there's no other artifact of the vote other than something kept in the, in the software storage medium, so there's no piece of paper. Uh, there are these kinds of machines, electronic voting machines, with a paper trail. Typically, we refer to those as DRE with a VVPAT. Sorry, it's so many acronyms, it's ridiculous. The DRE, right, direct recording electronic, we just uh, went over that. But VVPAT is a, a voter verifiable paper audit trail. Essentially, in many cases, this looks like a receipt printer attached to the machine behind glass that prints the voter's choices before they officially cast their ballot. And in those systems, the votes are kept 
both on the receipt printer, so kept on paper, but also they're kept in electronic storage. And why would that be? Why would you want to do that? Well, if you aggregate all those electronic results, you can then send them or, or, or you know, uh, uh, drive them into election headquarters and get results much more quicker than you could if you ever tried to count many, many rolls of uh, the, these, these paper trail receipts, right? Um, a lot of folks are going to encounter the, the, the second, the, the, the final two categories here, the optical scan machines. If you've ever taken a standardized test, you've, you've, you've interacted with these kinds of things. Typically, you fill in an oval or other kind of mark on a piece of paper and stick it in a machine that sucks it in and then counts all the filled in ovals on that uh, ballot. Uh, there are more fancy things these days even that combine some of the fully electronic versions and the optical scan versions. So there are things called ballot marking devices or BMDs. And you can think of these as like $10,000 pens, basically. You walk up to it with a blank ballot, it sucks it in, you interact with a touch screen to make your choices, and then it just fills in the ovals for you, so to speak. Uh, it's very, I'm, I'm being very hand wavy. You can't see my hands waving, but I'm waving my hands. Uh, anyway, uh, but, but those are sort of a new generation of ones. They don't actually keep any digital results in the machine. They just fill in the ovals for you. And so the, all the, the versions here that have paper are what we call software independent voting machines, which means that a problem with the software, as long as people are checking those paper trails, which is a serious concern, a problem with the software cannot affect the actual result of the election. So there's an increasingly rich forest of best practices around cybersecurity controls here. Um, what we'll be talking about here in a bit, we're, we actually are standing on the shoulders of really good other work. And at CDT, we do a lot of what we call digital hygiene work, trying to make sure that people spend time in their daily routines on their digital hygiene as well as sort of other aspects of hygiene that they typically spend um, parts of their day on. Um, here, there's, these are the, the and I'll say these out loud just in case you're on the phone and can't see these, uh, but there are sort of three great places for this right now. The Belfer Center at Harvard has a number of uh, uh, materials that you can use to understand how cybersecurity affects elections specifically. So the, there's the, the, the crown jewel is the state and local election cybersecurity playbook, which gives election officials and others an understanding of what the, the top things they need to be doing to protect their elections. And just to give you a preview, two-factor authentication, so making sure that um, we aren't relying just on usernames and passwords to uh, allow people access to their accounts, but that we also require them to have something besides the password, so another factor. Uh, uh, you may be most familiar, familiar with that for when you go to log into your bank and if your bank isn't convinced it's you, they may text you on your phone a six-digit code that you have to enter in. That's them requiring you to prove that not only do you know the username and password, but that you, you, you have access to this, this phone to be able to log in. Um, and then other things that are a little, more, little less concrete, for example, we're all realizing that election officials need to build a, a culture of cybersecurity into their operation. And so it's not a checklist. It's not something that you can procure or, or buy and just be done with, but something that you have to embed into the culture of your operations. And increasingly, this is something we've emphasized at CDT, not just in elections, but increasingly all of us need to spend a little bit more time thinking about the security and privacy of our data in, in order to protect it. You know, it's, it's not something we can rely on others to do. We have to take our own agency to do those things. Uh, the Belfer Center also has a couple of other things that are really neat. They have a election cybersecurity incident communications coordination guide along with a template for some materials for election officials about how to communicate with the press. And if you're, if you're on this call, you're a member of the press, you might want to look at that because you might be getting a lot of very similar looking communications <laughs> from folks. And you might want to anticipate questions from the template and the guide that, that you may have after getting something back from someone that you've talked to. The final thing that they have that they haven't released yet as far as I've seen, they have a tabletop exercise guide. So tabletop exercises are sort of the fire drills for cybersecurity. Um, this is essentially trying to plan a worst case scenario, but at the same time, 
not something that's totally outlandish. And instead of having the actual horrific disaster happen in real time, you pretend like it happens and everyone goes through the motions they would go to go through to respond to that kind of an action. Um, there's a variety of things you can do. You can have a data breach tabletop exercise. You can have a, an intrusion. You can have an active shooter. So something that's not even cybersecurity related. All those things are good things to set aside time to practice um, if you're election official. And if you're a journalist, you, you guys may be doing this um, in, your, in your own operations. And uh, um, it's just kind of sad, but that's just how it is these days. Um, the second sor uh, uh, source of very good best practices in cybersecurity for elections is the Center for Internet Security, or CIS. These are the folks who run um, the EI-ISAC and the MS-ISAC. The EI-ISAC is an abbreviation for Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center, and the MS-ISAC is the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. These are um, proverbial water coolers around which members of the uh, critical infrastructure sector, so be it either state or local government and the MSISEC or election officials and the EIISEC can uh, um, uh, get information that might be shared by DHS or other election officials about potentially active threats and other kinds of things that may be going on uh, that they would want to know about. Uh, and it provides forms and a variety of other things that are focused pretty much on information sharing. And this is also where we're starting to see um, state level election officials get security clearances to be able to get some of the more um, uh, uh, harder to distribute data, I should say, some of the classified uh, types of data that we increasingly need in order to be able to protect uh, 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 voters as election officials. The final one I'll mention, and I'm happy to take any questions on this, um, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, National Academies of Science, issued a report last Thursday, Securing the Vote, Protecting American Democracy, that is just a watermark study in what we need right now for election security. It recommends uh, paper ballots by 2020 or paper trails, some sort of paper record everywhere throughout the United States by 2020. In 2018, 80% of voters are gonna vote on machines that either create or keep a paper trail. So we got 20% left to go, five big states still out there. Um, 30 odd other states have some chunk of their counties or towns being paperless DREs. Um, they recommend risk limiting audits, which is kind of weird because I worked on those in my postdoc. We help invent these things and people are using them and they want to use them even faster. Um, but these are risk limiting audits are, you can think of as statistical recounts. They're a way of counting a subset of the ballots in an election to get a level of confidence that you know the outcome you called was correct or incorrect. And you may have to count them all uh, in order to get the right answer. Um, they also recommend a bunch of other things that we're happy to talk about, although one I'm not happy to talk about. Um, uh, no internet voting. <laughs> it should be sort of obvious to technical folks why there's no internet voting. Um, uh, if it's not obvious, feel free to ask us why. <laughs> um, short story, your devices, the servers, and the networks you use are totally insecure. Why would you want to vote for government office on those um, facilities until we've shored those up a little bit? It's the next generation internet that will be able to do that. Um, and then they said the last thing people should be thinking about is blockchain. So please don't ask us questions about blockchain in the election. Um, we may not answer them here. I'm happy to send you a, a form uh, uh, that I uh, – quotable comments about blockchain in the election that I tend to send people. Uh, but I'm hoping not to spend too much time here on that. Oh, I guess I just did. <laughs> so finally um, – in terms of CDT's efforts specifically, I'm going to run through some of the things we're doing. Um, the first thing we've been doing is a partnership with the Center for Technology and Civic Life. Um, CDT and CTCL have been uh, teaching election officials this summer about basic cybersecurity concepts. And so we have a series we've run twice now of three courses, Election Cybersecurity 101, 201, and 301. And we've taught a little bit less than 300 individual election officials about this kind of stuff. And it's very basic all the way up to pretty sophisticated. So it starts off with, you know, what are cyber threats? What are the kinds of things you could, you could imagine here that may be specifically related to cybersecurity? What's the kind of lingo that's appropriate to be using here? If, they, if someone uses a term you don't understand, where do you look that up? And then it goes into things like two-factor authentication, 
um, denial of service mitigation, intrusion detection. So it gets pretty sophisticated all the way up to and including talking to election officials about how to look at their infrastructure through the lens of the NIST cybersecurity framework. And if you're not familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework, it's essentially a very, very useful risk management tool that breaks down any given operation into five steps. And it's very useful for election officials to look at their operations and think about these steps from um, identification, prevention, um, mitigation, detection, and recovery. I believe those are, I may have got those slightly wrong. Um, and then um, th those courses all have, you know, uh, it's a real-time, massive, <laughs> massively connected webinar, which uh, is, is a challenge in and of itself, um, with participant guides and videos and stuff like that, and we've gotten a lot of good feedback, and we're probably going to run these again. Um, we don't allow press on, I'm sorry, it's mostly because we want election officials to be able to say things about their operations that wouldn't we wouldn't want to be newsworthy <laughs> um, without them knowing they're talking to the press. Um, but I'm sure there's ways we could preview that content for you if you'd want to see that stuff. Second, uh, we've been actually producing usable materials for election officials. And so um, if you're on the phone, you're, you'll have to look at these slides later to get a, 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 some insight into what we're looking at here. Um, but by all means, all these links are available on cdt.org, uh, including this presentation. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is the first of, uh, I think we have Two of these things out now, three um, uh, actually today, uh, we have uh, these field guides. They're essentially short one-page front and back documents about very specific topics in cybersecurity that an election official or an or a, or a, a IT administrator or someone associated with elections can grab, learn what they need to know about a particular cybersecurity topic and then use that as a as either a persuasive document for their management or as a guide for how they could actually start going from zero to 60 on a given topic. Um, so the, the one you're seeing right now is on two-factor authentication. We figured the first one out of the gate should be the, the thing that we think is one of the biggest issues in elections, which is, you know, two-factor authentication and making sure you don't get fished, that you don't have email sent to you that spoofs um, other folks to grab your credentials or, or, or cause you to install malware. Um, the second one that's on the screen right now is uh, all about passwords. How do you create, manage, store uh, good passwords? And it, it, you'll be glad to hear some of you that we say things like, it's okay to write your passwords down. It's not against the rules. Just don't post them on your monitor. Um, put If you write your passwords down, put them somewhere where you would put a wallet full of cash, you know, like think about $1,000 worth of cash. You wouldn't put that right next to your monitor or your computer. Um, especially at a coffee shop if you walk away, right? Um, the next thing that we've been doing quite a bit of um, is direct outreach, out, excuse me, direct outreach to election officials. And so some of you on the, on the phone will be glad you can't see this because it's a picture of me. <laughs> I'm not the, the most pretty person in the world. Um, teaching uh, legis state legislators and election officials how to do threat modeling. So how to think about the assets that they have and which assets they're protecting, which assets they may not be protecting as well as they could. This uses a set of, of security uh, game cards from a professor of computer science, uh, Tadayoshi Kono in Washington, at the University of Washington, that it makes turns threat modeling, something that many people might find very boring, boring into a game, a sort of a gamified cybersecurity exercise. Um, uh, my colleague Maurice has been out speaking to a, a bunch of election officials and state, leg, state legislators um, about election cybersecurity and, and even more um, complicated topics such as the, the you know, tension between state and national uh, uh, roles with resources and other kinds of um, uh, cybersecurity response. Um, finally, we've been working on some things that are sort of on the margin, so to speak. and so. The thing you're looking at here on your screen is our InfoSec toolkit for election volunteering. And this came to us as a revelation that, you know, um, DHS now that elections are considered critical infrastructure, now DHS can come to you and there's a whole bunch of things they can do um, that are free for you as an election official. The trick is, is there's a bit of a line. There's a bit of a wait before when, between when you ask for these services and when you get them. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, have, doesn't necessarily have to be that way. There are information, information security or cybersecurity professionals spread 
uniformly almost <laughs> across the United States, wherever there are humans, there's gonna be nerds, I guess is the way to say it. Um, and these folks can do technical volunteering of a kind that typical poll workers can't do. So say for example, you're an election official and you're really keen to have DHS come out and do what's called a network scan. That's where they scan your network looking for uh, devices you may not know that are on your network or vulnerable devices that you may know but not realize that they had particular vulnerabilities. But network scanning is the kind of thing that cybersecurity professionals do all day, every day. And, 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 and that's not something that you need to necessarily wait for DHS for. And if you do those kinds of things, you may be much better prepared for when someone, either DHS or maybe you hired your own cybersecurity firm, will be much better prepared for when they do show up. Um, and there's some um, defensive stuff we do sort of on the advocacy side. As I said, blockchain is bad, okay. Um, paper and audits are very good, but they're necessary, they're, they're necessary but insufficient. You know, a lot of the work right now, and it, right, we're 57 days before the November 6th election today, a lot of the work right now in the lead up to the election is concentrating on the low hanging fruit in terms of cybersecurity itself. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you. I, I spoke the whole time, sorry, Maurice. Um, but what we'll do now is uh, we have questions from, uh, and so for those of you on the phone, this is the last slide that says thank you and gives us some of our contact details. So J.M. Porup from CSO Online. So uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, it says, I've heard a lot of speculation about supply chain attacks against voting machines. Has anyone reverse engineered machines in the field to test this hypothesis? Um, so uh, the questioner asked a couple of things that are related. So uh, supply chain attacks and then reverse engineering of machines in the field. So uh, those two things aren't necessarily directly related, right? Um, you can get any kind of technology and do what's called reverse engineering to figure out how it works. Um, and I think to maybe enrich your question a little bit, a little bit, JM, I, I think I would rephrase it and say, has anyone in the process of reverse engineering voting machines found evidence of supply chain attacks against the voting machine? Um, there has been quite a bit of reverse engineering, so this may get a little technical, sorry everyone. There has been quite a bit of reverse engineering of software uh, associated with voting systems, the ones we can get our hands on, um, for example, the Sequoia, I'm gonna use some brand names here, sorry everyone, there, there will be a recording of this. <laughs> um, the Sequoia AVC Advantage, uh, which is used heavily in, throughout New Jersey, was reverse engineered about 10 years ago um, and, and used to mount very sophisticated attacks like what are called return-oriented programming attacks. In a few cases, like the, the, the Diebold AccuVote TS, which is the one, the TS and the TSX, that's the one you may have seen the New York Times um, if you haven't seen this, I encourage you to go check it out. Alex Halderman, a professor of uh, computer science at the University of Michigan. The New York Times is doing increasingly video editorials. Uh, this is a new thing to me. Uh, maybe it's not to all of you. But there's a video editorial of Alex Halderman showing a mock election that he rigs at University of Michigan. And in order to do that, he had to do some reverse engineering of that machine. Um, the only case in which we've seen any artifacts of the supply chain in the software and this is because we, we haven't been looking at this a lot, but we, we definitely will in the future, is with this machine called the AVS WinVote, which we, we, I call the great Satan of voting machines, because like you literally turn this thing on and it starts up its own Wi-Fi access point, which is like a big red flag. You know, why should a voting machine have a Wi-Fi access point? It shouldn't, and it shouldn't have a cellular modem, which this thing had as well. But recently at DEF CON, when they were looking at the images used to, um, the, the disk images, basically the, the data that is used to prepare those machines before they go out into the field, they noticed that there was a bunch of Chinese MP3s on there and a bunch of other Chinese software. Um, nothing that looked malicious, but definitely the person that was developing this software was doing other uh, things unrelated to his work or her work um, while they were developing the software and there was plenty of evidence left on the voting machines of what they were doing. It just looked like they were listening to uh, Chinese pop songs, as far as we can tell. Um, we haven't seen any evidence that that's malicious. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer of saying, no evidence through reverse engineering of supply chain attacks. I'm really hoping uh, reporters will go to the Philippines, for example, or other places where a lot of this stuff is built. Like the Philippines is the main supply chain for election systems and software, one of the, the biggest vendor throughout the world of voting machines. Um, that's a great story. If you want to do some investigative journalism, go see 
how sound their supply chain is in the Philippines. I have no idea if it's good or bad. Um, I'm hoping it, I'm hoping that there'll be room for improvement, but um, that it's mostly good. Okay. Did I miss anything that you wanted to mention, Marie? I think you covered a, a good deal of it. I'm kind of surprised there aren't more questions about <clears throat> sort of some of the activities that we saw at DEF CON and the things that have happened since then. Like the National Academies report, which is glorious. Not a single blockchain question, I'm surprised. There has been some interesting movement when it comes to uh, public attribution of some of these nation state actors and their involvement, not only in the 2016 elections, but also in 2018 elections. DHS, Department of Justice, Microsoft coming out, uh, making statements about exactly what has happened, some techniques, some tools, um, attribution that we haven't seen in the past. We've also seen the private sector step up, which is an interesting storyline. There's a number of private sector entities offering free or low cost cybersecurity products or services to election officials, notably um, Google's Jigsaw via Project Shield and Cloudflare, the Athenian project, which offer DDoS mitigation services to election officials for free. That's something to make sure your website never goes down. Um, there's a company, Synac, who is offered um, free penetration testing services to state-level election officials. Um, we're in some initial discussions with 1Password to provide free um, password managers to election officials so that they don't have to think about storing their passwords. They have a piece of software that does that for them. So we can talk a little bit about the relative level of preparedness of different states. Um, as we said, there are some 80% of voters in 2018 will vote on systems that keep or maintain uh, paper, which is a good sign because paper is a very important part of running governmental elections. You know, if, if you have a software crash or, 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 or a, an attack or even just errors, you're going to want to have that paper to recount later. It's super unsatisfying to hit the enter key over and over again and get the same number, or in some cases get a different number over and over again. Um, so lots of states are using paper. Only three states, Colorado, Virginia, and I forget the other one, are doing risk limiting audits or have statutes on the books that would do these sort of fancy audits. Um, New Mexico, I love uh, uh, my friend Maggie Louise, uh, Maggie Louise, Maggie Toulouse Oliver, the Secretary of State of, of New Mexico, but their audit is, call, is more properly called a risk-based audit, not risk-limiting, because it never could actually escalate to the full thing. Um, so auditing is a place where we have a lot of work to do. There's only three states that have the provisions for that. Um, on the books, all the other states are sort of playing catch up with older versions of audit mechanisms. But in the, on the same side, we have a lot of work to do to show election jurisdictions how to do audits um, simply, easily, and efficiently, because they're, they're, they're very young. They've only been around, these particular ones have only been around for about 10 years. We have not as much experience, you know, compared to hundreds of years of casting paper ballots. Um, in terms of cybersecurity, there are a number of states that we know of that have entered into uh, contracts to do certain things like penetration testing of their voter registration database. And this is, you can imagine, uh, hiring good guys to hack your system so you know what the bad guys will do. That's called white hat hacking. Um, so Rhode Island, I know, spent a bunch of money um, doing a voter, a voter registration penetration test. Florida has done that as well in addition to securing um, a large firm, I believe it's SecureWorks, to do a bunch of cybersecurity testing and services. Um, and, and one interesting question, I'm just going to sit here and, and, and ask ourselves questions. Um, what, are the kind, what are kinds of issues that reporters that should be writing on that they aren't writing on yet? Um, one of the things that I'm really keen to know more about, and someone out there, uh, should you choose to take the mission, uh, is ransomware. So, you know, we have all these great answers in terms of passwords, two-factor, blah, blah, blah. But when it comes to responding to a ransomware attack, that's a place where it gets dicey even for us as experts, right? So ransomware is a type of malicious software that locks up your computer or your entire network and holds your data or your network or both hostage. Um, that's a place where we've seen Atlanta, we've seen a number of Montgomery County, Alabama, um, completely taken offline by these ransomware attacks and sitting there thinking of, well, 
should we pay the $70,000 bounty or should we try and rebuild our systems? Um, Atlanta, it looks like it went the way of rebuilding its systems. You can imagine a ransomware attack on an election office uh, two weeks, a month out from an election could be very serious and essentially stop them cold in, in what they're doing. Uh, and it may be very hard to recover because even if, you know, hopefully all of you out there are backing up your devices and your phone. If you're not, you're going to learn the hard way that you should be doing that. Um, but it's very hard to restore or even practice restoring uh, these kinds of things. So, for example, how would you practice restoring your phone, which probably has a lot of uh, very important contact information, probably has some secure uh, uh, uh messaging apps and stuff like that, how would you get up and running on a brand new phone um, with, within, you know, a few hours of losing access to your old phone? That Think of that and then spread that across an entire network and a bunch of devices. It gets very, very difficult to make sure you're backing up the right stuff and to make sure you can replicate or make sure you can recover from something that re removes all of the stuff you've been working on from, uh, it, it's very hard to recover. Anyways. I don't know to what extent people are practicing for that kind of stuff. I don't know to what extent they're using solutions that might make that easier, um, but we, I guarantee we'll see one or two jurisdictions get hit by a ransomware attack in these 57 days before the election. Speaking of Atlanta, let's look back a little bit. The, the ransomware actually hit back in March, and um, even now Atlanta is still recovering from that process. So it may not even be something that um, happens near election day. It, it might be an issue that occurs several months before, but because the recovery procedures were not in place or at least exercised, um, that recovery process can be drawn out. And I think many of us would consider to be Atlanta to be a major city, has financial resources that are not normal when you're talking about jurisdictions of much smaller sizes. And as of now, uh, that price tag of recovery is $17 million. Um, but that pales in comparison where you're talking about the cost of lost data. So, for example, the police department lost some criminal evidence, including dash cam footage. There, there is no monetary value to that, but there is obviously a, a civic and legal value to that. Uh, so thinking about the ramifications of what happens if some of those records are permanently destroyed and have to be rebuilt. So if there's something like voter registration databases that are permanently um, deleted and not recoverable, how long would it take to actually rebuild that? What does that process look like? Um, would the voters who live in that jurisdiction need to actually go out and re-register? Um, what does the confidence recovery process look like? Could a jurisdiction actually convince all of the eligible uh, adult voters to go back and, and register to vote? Um, with the, the pinky promise that next time we'll protect your data, your data better. I, I don't know that jurisdictions are preparing for that, and certainly I'm not confident that the smaller jurisdictions would have the capacity to do that without some sort of help from the state or even the federal governments. We've got a uh, pretty cheeky question from one of you out there saying, what is some sensational trash people are writing about and shouldn't be writing about? <laughs> Um, That's where we play DEF CON bingo. <laughs> Kids hacking votes is some sensational trash. Um, blockchain and voting is some sensational trash. Internet voting is sensational trash. And the reason I say that is all those things are distractions from like what we all need to be concentrating on, which is you know keeping our eyes on the prize. Um, uh, uh, anyway. Um, I, I don't even want to talk about the sensational trash. I'll add one more, which is that. Um, the Russians were not involved in the interference of our 2016 elections. That would be pretty sensationalist. Um, and I think even more so, trying to focus on one in particular threat actor um, can be very narrow-sighted. So if all we're doing is talking about how we're going to keep the Russians out, it doesn't speak to some of the other countries that have capabilities that are equal to or maybe even greater uh, than the Russians from nation-state level, so your, your China's of the world, uh, North Korea. But even then, considering some of the other actors that are involved that would have a stake in either swaying the outcome of an election uh, or even just damaging the process itself, so talking about organized crime um, or other activists. And the one that I like to put out there that some folks might forget about are just the, the lucky hackers, the folks who are keying in on one particular configuration because they have identified a vulnerability in a certain system that may not know or even care 
that they're having an impact on election systems. They might be out exploring and find themselves in um, other areas of critical infrastructure like a hospital or an oil refinery or even just a, a school or a business. Um, but it might also be that they find themselves in an election system. Um, they're not necessarily focused on disrupting or changing votes, uh, but their actions could lead to those particular outcomes. And to close things out, I'll make a one quick plea for uh, using your newsworthiness glasses and looking at stories about election failures. Stories of election failures may also be stories of election successes. <laughs> and so keep your eyes out for the chance to, to, to ask yourself, is this story that I'm prepared to write about a failure here actually not a success? And the reason I say that is there's a bunch of things I've seen lately where editors are pushing their people to find, oh, geez, what's wrong with these voting machines? And so they write up a whole story when, in fact, from my perspective, you know, a couple of these things are showing how, how it's supposed to work. You caught the bad guys before they got too far. And so please keep your eyes peeled for a chance to make not just the negative, oh, elections are horrible, um, kind of stories, but also the ones that might um, show how hard election officials work to, to make their various contingency plans line up so that people could vote. Um, that may not have the same newsworthy calculus, but it's, it's really nice to see those stories because it, it, it underlines how hard people are working to protect elections. I think that dovetails nicely into this glossary that we're going to publish later today when we're talking about being precise and being specific with the terms. So not everything is a hack, and, and not every um, potential issue or mistake that we see with elections this year um, is going to be the result of some sort of a malicious um, attempt to change the process. Um, so when we're talking about precision in vocabulary, think of things like scanning, um, infiltration, exfiltration. So using those more specific terms to really give the, the public um, a better idea about what is actually going on. Because if we continue to use terms like hack, which is a, a very broad and overreaching term, um, we're never going to be able to have the more substantive conversation, which is how do we prevent some of these more specific um, attacks from happening? So I would encourage you to take a look at the glossary and, and see what you can do to um, help educate your readers and help, help educate some of the policymakers so that we can have that deeper discussion. You can get to that election if you're looking on via the webcast. Um, the second link on the page to CDT's election work points to um, our election campaign site. But if but it, uh, you can just go to cdt.org, click on campaigns, and then click on elections, and you'll see the glossary. I believe is up there now. Yes, I just got the the thumbs up. The glossary is up there now. It should be particularly useful for uh, journalists covering elections. Uh, and, and this presentation is also up there um, right now. So if you were on the phone and didn't get to see it, you can grab it there. If you were on the WebEx, you can grab it for uh, your record. Um, and then there's the, the other two field guys and the Election InfraSec Toolkit are there as well. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much for uh, joining this uh, presentation. And if you have any questions on election security um, after this briefing, uh, please go ahead and send those to press at cdt.org and we'll uh, send those to Joe and Maurice and hopefully get back to you as soon as possible. So, all right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Have a great day, everybody.